several for posting it. The Instagram, it tells everything. I don't post it. We we have a we have a great team <laughs> who gets it going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a couple of classes just ended, so we'll wait a few minutes and uh, introduce you. Sure. And uh, we'll kind of get this going. And you're kind of closing out the semester, Everald. We'll we'll have a an open house. Uh, as I think you know, we normally do an open house where we clear out the studios and display all the work, and it's quite lovely. And we really can't do that now, but um, we've been doing a virtual open house, which isn't quite as nice, but it's something. You have to send me an invite. I don't think you've done that yet. I, I'll do that. I'll do that. Uh, yeah, the, the open house is great. We get the studios cleaned, which is the real reason for doing it. But don't tell <laughs> our students that. And uh, and they look really they look really great when they set up all the work. It's it's pretty nice. And friends and parents and spouses and and prospective students come. It's a it's a kind of nice event. Yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to the fall when I guess the students are back in the space and at least we yeah. can have some sort of open house together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be it'll be quite a game changer. I, I, I keep saying we need to learn how to be in studio again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we need to learn how to be civilized and <laughs> all the various decorum. So, oh, this looks like another familiar face, Saba. <laughs> I think, I think you're I think you're pulling your your first Hong Kong crew in this lecture. I know. Uh, this is impressive. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? Nice hey. to see everyone. Great to see you, Saba. Gosh. Good to see you too. Hey, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been too long. It's been too long. Agreed. You guys in Miami? Um, yes, I'm working in Miami. Great. 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 Yeah, you know, I should have put you all to work for thesis. I'm, I'm now. I'm thinking, hmm, all these thesis critics and final review critics. You're going to hear from me. <laughs> Happy to do it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Same here. Let me know next time. I, I will. Work for me, so. Yeah. 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 No, but, I will. Um, the good and the bad of the pandemic is that I've been able to participate in size reviews. Ah, good, good. So where are you teaching, Sai? Um, right now I'm teaching at Coventry University, which is like an hour outside of the city. Right, right. Good, good. And what, what levels are you teaching? What kind of classes? I'm teaching all levels. Yeah. <laughs> I've taught second and third year, um, and it's, it's only three years in the UK, and then I'm right. teaching graduate design studies as well, and I'm also teaching construction and tech modules. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Coventry looks like very first semester they're doing a full building, right? I mean, that website is serious. The whole UK does, does <laughs> that as part yeah. of the um, accreditation. Mm. Is that first year grad? First year undergrad. First year undergrad. That's right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a whole, whole different thing. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. It's it's very different. I mean, it's three years. It's very focused, and you typically only take two classes a, a semester. You don't really wow. take. They don't really have the concept of electives. Yeah. Huh. I, I know that the um, I, I forget what it is, but they have the different gold silver ratings for teaching and for research in the UK, and that seems to be a real driver when you see advertisements for positions and descriptions of the universities and everything so yeah yeah i think universities tend to choose i mean coventry really focuses on teaching instead of research yeah. not that they don't do research but it's just not their, yeah 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 main priority yeah yeah mm, that's interesting um let me ask uh the people that run the show here uh Hannah and Audrey, are we uh, good to go? Should be, yeah. Yeah, okay. All righty. Um, we'll probably have some stragglers, uh, Everald, but I think it's five after and we can get going. Is that sounds okay good. with you? Okay. Yeah, sounds good. So um, I'll ask everyone to uh, uh, turn off their cameras and their mics.
so we have as much bandwidth as possible here for our speaker. And I'll introduce uh, Everald in just a second, but let me just say a couple of things, a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to thank you all for being here today. I know it's getting busy towards the end of the term. Um, you're, you're gearing up for reviews. We'll have an open house, so you'll be able to peruse all the Moreau boards for all the different studios. And we'll celebrate our uh, graduating group of, I think it's 35 or 36, in addition to the six or seven or eight that graduated in the fall. So we have a pretty big class this year. Um, we have a huge class entering core one in the uh, in the fall. We have 60 people entering, so we're very excited about that. And we have a big gaggle of undergrads showing up, so it'll be busy in the fall. Now, we don't have definitive word on how the fall is going to work yet, but let me tell you, you need to get vaccinated. If you're a student um, in the School of Architecture and Community Design, uh, I want you to get vaccinated unless there's some extenuating reason that you should not per your doctor. The sooner we get ourselves sorted out with the vaccine, the sooner we'll be able to be back as a group, as a cohort uh, in the studios, uh, learning side by side and day by day. So I can't stress that enough. I'm speaking for the faculty, uh, for myself and for USF Health, <laughs> for the university. They want everyone to be safe and um, please um, take care of business. It's so easy to get vaccinated now and we want you to stay safe and, and, and be with us next semester. Um, also, registration for the summer is open. There's a ton of interesting electives and studios um, and there's a core three studio that I really want those of you in core two to think about taking. Uh, we're working out the faculty. I'm talking to two people right now and that'll be announced early next week. But um, get in there and register for classes. Okay, so today in my mind, we have a very special guest. I've been wanting to have Avril Colas. I want Avril Colas to be more involved with the university period and with the School of Architecture, but I've been keen to have him just talk about his background, his work, and uh, begin the process of meeting you as a, as, a, as a school and as a student cohort. I was looking at your bio here and I was trying to put dates together, which I'm I'm I'm, I'm more and more incapable of doing. <laughs> it's more and more of a blur. No problem. But, but I've known you since wait a second. I'm gonna say I can't find your grade. Okay. I'm gonna say since two thousand three. Two thousand two, exactly. Two thousand two. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you have it. Um, <laughs> Professor Sanders in here would like to hear what you have to say. <laughs> He's sitting next to her um, since 2002. So it's almost our 20th anniversary, Everald. <laughs> I'm so excited. Um, speaking of anniversaries, uh, it's coming up on 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 your anniversary. Um, it is, it is, I think, it is. and it's it's and and we're hours away from my anniversary. Come to think of it, <laughs> our anniversary is tomorrow. And uh, I have to run out and get something. It just occurred to me. Um, <laughs> you don't make that mistake, Errol, do you? Um, I, um, no, I'm, I'm being recorded. Of course not. So, <laughs> Errol Polos came on the Hong Kong China program that Nancy Sanders, Professor Sanders and I ran years ago at Florida. And he and Lauren, his beautiful, lovely wife, spent their honeymoon with us in Hong Kong and China. It was the best honeymoon ever. <laughs> <laughs> and we all enjoyed it. Um, OK, seriously, um, I I've known Everett for almost 20 years, and he's uh, accomplished some mighty extraordinary things in that time. Um, you've probably read the piece that we put out, and I'm not going to repeat all of that, but it's worth noting he is an award-winning Haitian-American architect, an educator, and storyteller, and we'll hear more about that soon. With design experience in hospitality work, aviation, multifamily and institutional buildings. He's led a variety of internationally acclaimed projects during his time as a practitioner. And as a designer, Everald specializes in projects that require a certain sensitive approach to integrating mixed use buildings in a historical context. He's skilled in guiding clients through the process of finding their project's identity within numerous constraints 
and helping to ensure that complex projects are distilled to their design essence. And I think this is a very interesting um, skill set to have and one that I'm, I'm not entirely sure can be taught in school, but it's kind of learned through experience and intuition. And, and, and he also says, and this is very important to me, we were talking earlier today about some of these issues. He's motivated to find solutions for designing equitable spaces for the voiceless and believes the design is a tool for social change. Um, how appropriate, Everell, to have you talk today. And I know a little bit about what we're going to talk about the same week that we see the verdict come down on the George Floyd murder. Um, so Everald is the owner of Storm Studio for Architecture. It's a practice that works at both the local and the international scale. Um, a little bit more about his background. He holds uh, three degrees, a bachelor degree, a master's degree um, of architecture, both from UF, Gainesville, and finally a master of science in architectural pedagogy from from Gainesville, which gives him an unusual uh, background skill set in, in architectural education. Um, his work experience prior to opening up his firm is, is really uh, very interesting. He worked at um, Clement Halsband Architects in New York. He worked for Grimshaw Architects. Many of you know Grimshaw. We had uh, one of the partners of Grimshaw Lecture some years ago. And he worked for BIG, the Bark Ingalls Group, BIG in New York for some years, working on a very wide range of projects between those three extremely interesting and I should guess quite different firms, but you'll 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 speak to that. Sure. And he also worked with our friend Jason Jensen and Wanamaker Jensen Architects here in St. Pete when he first returned to Florida. So without any further ado, let me turn it over to you, Everald. Ever call us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course, and Bob, you are seeing my screen. Yep. Great. So Bob, yes, thank you for uh, having me. And uh, thank you to students who are able to join. Uh, my colleagues uh, uh, that are on, I really appreciate you taking this time to su support this talk and just my friends in the general community. Thank you for your support. And, and Bob, one, one more time, I know we talked about this on the phone, but special thanks to you. Yeah, you know, I've had a chance to sit in a few reviews in the past five years at USF. Um, and thoroughly impressed by the work and energy that's coming out of that university. And not only that, in my time in New York, I shared the workspace with a, a few colleagues that were graduates of USF um, and just sort of solid contributors to the studio. So a job well done, I know, has a lot to do with your leadership, your energy, um, and, and what you have brought to that university. My title for the talk today is Belonging, and uh, certainly there's a subtitle in my head, but I'm hoping through sharing a series of slides with you, you'll be able to stitch one for yourself. Uh, it'll be a little less technical talk than um, I'm used to giving about our work and a bit more of a personal narrative uh, for you to uh, uh, follow along with me. So as Bob said, I'm, I'm humbled to be the founder of Storen Studio for Architecture. Uh, as a practice, we are committed to civic engagement and how we can promote strong communities, create more inclusive spaces, foster placemaking for our neighborhoods. And at best, if we can, we, we want to make sure we're identity affirming to individuals within a community and a greater city. Uh, I want to reiterate what Bob said. We do believe that design is a tool for social change and that strong design is a right for all, which enables a voice to the voiceless. Um, and and our, our vision and design approach is twofold. It's stemming from our experience of actively listening and collaborating with our partners, our clients, uh, and folks in the community. Um, and, and to put it plainly, we, we, we try to unearth a, a narrative um, and research plays a significant role in our design process about a place. Uh, and for that, we call ourselves storytellers, and, and these are um, our storytellers here on the screen. And I have to say, in whatever way from now and several years to come, if, 
if Storm is serving the community well through design, it's very much uh, because of the folks you see on the screen. Without them, the, the, the practice um, cannot thrive. Uh, this afternoon, you only hear from, from one person um, out of the 11, but uh, these, these folks on the screen are, are key to our success. Often, when we're in the middle of a design process for a project, uh, and we're, when we're talking about material research, we, we get to a point where we're always negotiating if the material research um, and choices are just as rich as the kind of research in, that we did early on in the project. And for me, it, uh, often one memory comes back, and it's a memory that, as far as I can remember, happens when I was three years old. And it's being in my mom's courtyard in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Uh, it was a space for me that, you know, faced the sidewalk, the right of way. It inset itself right off that sidewalk. Uh, there, there was a wrought iron gate, but during, you know, the, the daylight hours, it's open and it becomes a place of commerce. People can actually go in there uh, and enjoy it. My mom would allow several small businesses to sell their goods during that time. And meanwhile, while that's happening, as a very young person, I'm eating mangoes, I'm playing soccer, I'm seeing commerce and exchange um, at a very early age. Um, and it starts, I start to understand systems and communications and, and the importance of people in, uh, in a neighborhood and certain adjacencies. And then, of course, you know, we had a large well there, so I, I start to understand that uh, how, how we bring in resources, how much we use per day. But for me, it was a place I could linger. Um, it was a, a place that we were proud of and still are proud of. Um, and it's, it's my first time, and it's a, it's a word we use uh, here where we had an example of, of, of an urban room. Um, it negotiates private and public, but it's also a place where you want to linger. And certainly if you were to step out of my mom's courtyard proper and look at other parts of the city, uh, it, 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 it's not just sort of uh, just my mom's courtyard. You know, there's there's issues where you walk along and you see commerce. Um, and sure, folks are selling T-shirts, but it becomes sort of a, a, a tapestry, an urban fabric that says, "Engage with this edge, buy something, let's barter, let's know each other, possibly come back next week, and we'll we'll have a, a, a better deal for you." Uh, but but if, if we back off and and look at that material language. And in the lower right-hand corner, we're looking at El Arasatsu's, um, the Canadian sculptures, um, piece of work there, which I'd like to translate. It takes sort of really mundane materials, stitch them together and have another reading. Um, so for me, this memory lasts from being in the courtyard and talks about material richness, talks about lingering, talks about placemaking. And eventually we'll talk about identity and ownership and feeling as if you belong. But I have to say, um, I, I, I did also move to the United States uh, eventually, and my, my first uh, home was in Irvington, New Jersey. Um, and Irvington, New Jersey, uh, I'll, I'll talk about briefly, uh, and, and not to sort of uh, pick on, on, the, on the place itself, because I think it had issues that many American cities uh, have where places on the fringes are, are not um, getting as much attention. But I, I simply like to think about my time at, in Irvington as just public. There were public spaces. There were spaces where you can, <clears throat> where you can traverse, and there were places where you had edges. Um, but these moments seem just transactional. Um, you know, you, you would hope um, that you wouldn't have to uh, cash a check and lose a significant percentage and then use it next door. Um, you know, the, this urban edge was, was, was quick. It, it, it wasn't really being asked to linger here. Um, maybe if you even stay here too long, certain store owners may get a little sense of angst. Um, and it's not a place to establish uh, sort of a mutual ex exchange through commerce. I juxtapose that talk on Irvington. I show you this slide here, which is um, the first slide that myself and Elena Bresciani, and this was during my time at Bjarke Engels Group, and we were asked 
uh, to do a 233-unit uh, building in East Harlem. And uh, both myself and Elena, um, who saw this product design, and uh, a host of folks saw it through construction afterwards. But one of the things that we, we said as, as young designers was we wanted to attempt to unearth the history of East Harlem, and, and not only just where our project was on East 126, but along the whole 125th corridor. Um, you know, I have to say again, and I would, my personal position is um, deep research on a community can possibly redeem a location in terms of, cult, in terms of culture. Um, and it takes a critical eye and patience, you know, beyond just simply walking along 125th and seeing the ills of methadone clinics and folks hanging out. It takes, it takes a bit more study spatially to unearth um, the potential of a, of a place or beyond the trauma of that place. I bring this up because during this uh, design process, um, our, our boss during this time said something quite profound. It, it lasts um, certainly to uh, this day with me. Um, he mentioned that architects have very little to no power. And he says, we will rely on zoning rules, provision, and most of the times we're, we're being framed by an owner's budget or early vision. Um, but he said that we do have uh, the power of translation. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I agree with him uh, completely that we do have the power of translation. And moving forward with that project, the 233 unit um, uh, in, in East Harlem, we took, we took a lot of effort to make sure that we thought about a wide demographic. This 233 unit building was gonna be 80% market rate, 20% affordable. Um, and at first, um, maybe it could be slight, um, being naive, we were working really hard to maximize the buildable floor plate. As you can see, this is an infill project uh, between, <clears throat> between two buildings. Um, it, it actually elevates itself uh, above an existing building. Um, and we spent a lot of time doing a lot of gymnastics and zoning to make sure that we can fit a maximum floor plate. We spent several days on this, and there was a moment at a design meeting where someone outside of the design team asked, we, we have 80%, we have 20% affordable, we have 80% market rate, why are all the rooms the same size? I have to backtrack and give a little bit of anecdote. Um, New York, um, of course, always had early tax incentives. Um, to do affordable housing, but there was a moment where there was such a thing as a poor door, where the sort of spaces where the lower income or affordable units were were towards back the house, um, the finishes were 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 scaled down quite a bit, um, and it it brought a moment where where folks would understand who were living in market rate and who were living in lower income. It also brought a moment where the folks who were in the affordable units um, did not have a, a sense of, of ownership because they probably felt deemed um, lower income and therefore their rooms were subsidized and then they were stuck into a certain corner. But that question was asked. And um, being the leader of the projects, <laughs> even Elena and I felt, felt stuck on that question and we were really, really, um, we were really, really changed by this response um, by one of the leaders of our office at that time, which was, we do not design for the means of someone, we design to empower people. Uh, that moment of translation, of course, this practice had power and they were well known and in, in, in the, the particular client wanted to have this practice do this project, but to take that position to where all the rooms essentially are equal in square footage, do not have any back of house strange entry um, was a profound moment. And if I'm honest and humble was a moment that lit a light in, in front of me uh, where 
being in New York and practicing, I had a very linear vision of individual success and making myself up the ranks to this point, um, being able to say, uh, I'm, I'm here in a position to design for our greater community. I use this very, very small project that um, uh, Storin completed, uh, just to give another example of translation. This was um, um, an, uh, an actor friend of mine who uh, traveled quite a bit on the road and wanted to be able to design uh, uh, what we called very early on a, a fit kit, uh, so regular maintenance of being in a, in, on the road and staying in shape um, <clears throat> would, would, be, would be there. Um, I, I can't remember all the pieces. I think at, at some point we were fitting an ab roller, a massage ball, jump rope, sliding this, bungee cords um, and, and, and to this, into this project. And it was you know, a great time because folks in the office are, are really into industrial design and, and so am I. So this was a, a time for us to really um, stitch our talents at a, at a, at a scale of a, of a product. And you know, it, it was interesting that the client here um, who, who is jumping in the photo um, at one point, to the point of translation, uh, we had a very specific talk with this client and said, you know, indeed, this will do well and serve you and your colleagues uh, with similar lifestyle. But if we consider um, other aspects of folks who are rehabilitating from arthritis or folks who are at home and need to work out, uh, this product can be uh, certainly more inclusive. And to our <clears throat> to our great joy, um, he, he was uh, quite quite uh, uh, excited about that uh, uh, that idea of multi generational use. Um, and I, I want to take a moment because from this point on and sharing the slides, I'm going to eventually later jump into a, quite a bit of public space. But I, I have a firm belief in order for you to understand public space, um, you have to really understand what it means to be private. Um, I actually take the position that public is actually a conglomeration of several uh, private interests. Um, and this project, uh, it takes a particular uh, private interest. This was a project we did. Um, this was the accessible dwelling unit that we did in St. Pete, uh, Florida. We call it the, life, the loft library, and it presents as a refuge for for the for the owners. They're both avid readers. Um, they wanted a, a, a space to share their book collection, um, and this was sort of uh, exactly what they were looking for. Um, and on a quick on a quick design point, it was taking 400 square feet, doing a large piece of furniture that not can that not only can hold booklets but can also hold uh, a space to sleep above. And one of the things that I should say about this project, which is what makes us most proud, is the, the wife of a couple, um, they were both lawyers. She was actually a public defendant for most of her life. And because of the nature of her work, she had to sort of go off the grid and, and um, what she was left with was simply her books, her case files, um, as a way to remember some of the important work that she did for folks um, uh, during, during her time as an as a attorney. And for me, it was a profound moment that, you know, we're, we're still friends to this day where she really considers this space uh, a place of refuge where she can go back to her memories and understand what she had done um, earlier, even though publicly she can't um, uh, uh, speak about that experience too much. So a bit about a very private uh, project that we did um, and the idea of refuge in this case, um, a refuge to remember the kind of essential work that one has done. So to that moment of understanding private and then these private concepts become um, a collective. Um, I, I want to talk about uh, the city where where I live in now, which is in St. Pete. Um, I was just telling Bob that St. Pete has changed quite a bit from the time he knew it to the time I'm here now. I mean, it's, it's, it's average age is about uh, 42 years old. We were asked to um, 
design a mixed use project, which was 161 room, a boxy hotel and our uh, renovation of the existing building next door for a food hall. And before I get into the particulars about that project, I want to briefly talk about a few things that make St. Pete unique um, historically and then currently the things that St. Pete is dealing with in terms of density. So St. Pete's urban aesthetic is really defined by the growth that happened in 1920. This is an image looking down uh, Central Avenue uh, where you have sort of wide grid streets <clears throat> and um, space for pedestrians and space uh, for cars. Cars uh, move slowly, whereas the um, avenues north and south have quite a bit faster and a bit more vehicular um, uh, getting from one end of the bay to the beach. Um, I will, you know, I, I should pause on and on this slide and say that um, folk, you folks who, who know St. Pete understand that even though urbanistically this has been interesting in terms of good bones, there's certainly um, quite a bit of, of, of issues of people not having agency um, in terms of the of the green benches. But that's another lecture. Uh, to talk, to, so when you think about um, St. Pete, the waterfront park. Um, really sets it aside from any other Florida city. Um, it's interesting that 93% of the city is within a, a half mile walking distance from a green space, uh, which is which is which is quite rich and something that we kept in mind while we started to think about an infill project, not simply infilling the block. Um, to orient you, uh, of course, the bays on on the on the right, and if we were to go um, very very far on the left, we would be at the at the Gulf. Um, the the sort of circle there is where the project is is sited. And one of the things that I've noticed living here is St. Pete has a sort of rich history per neighbor per neighborhood. Uh, the, the old Northeast, you have. Uh, Kenwood, um, you have the Old Southeast. Um, you, of course, <clears throat> have further old, old Southeast that's been separated by um, the highway, which we've heard much about in terms of the 86-acre project that's happening with TROP right now. But, but what we wanted to do um, is to consider uh, this place here, this joint, as a way to um, weave these four concepts, these four neighborhoods as a place to, uh, to come together and essentially make a node in the city. But what we were hearing a lot of, and this is a very uh, quick diagram that came from the, the city, uh, zoning diagram came from the city, was there was a bit of angst that the city was increasing in density in terms of height and the, the mom and pop nature of stores along, along Central would 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 be dwarfed by larger buildings um and you know the 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 nature of arcades that were there in the 1920s as ways to move through um the streets uh were being lost by by large development so we were keen to think about the porosity of the city um during the 1920s and how we can reimagine that um in our project so our 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 project was was, was here. Um, the existing building that we were going to renovate is is here, um, and this was the site that we were going to <clears throat> to uh, place the 161 room hotel. And Central Avenue is running east to west, um, as you can see on the on the on the top of the screen. And then First Avenue South, which I mentioned, walk, uh, vehicular traffic drives um, a lot faster towards the east, and then First Avenue North, which is off the page, drives uh, faster towards the west. We wanted to look at this vacant land and make sure that once we articulated that we still had uh, a green space for folks to meet and that the building itself wouldn't completely overtake the infill. So quickly about the project, um, we had we had the vacant lot. We were going to immediately renovate um, this <clears throat> uh, furniture building to do a series of food halls. And what was Interesting about the food hall, which is um, a, a black owned business that actually leases several uh, 240 square feet food stalls for small businesses that are just getting on their feet. Chef, uh, chefs are using that space to sort of taste, uh, to sort of test their concepts. Um, 
So there was a very inclusionary component um, as you think about this building. And then we, we of course had to put program of hotel lobby, um, additional retail and make sure that the site stayed porous um, in the early ideas of the arcade. Um, and of course, you, to keep it sustainable, well, we, we had to have some sort of parking deck um, in order to deal with that. And this area here is the courtyard um, that I eventually want, want to get to. Um, and of course, the, the hotel itself uh, was here. A, a bit about site plan, uh, Central is here. Here are the, here's the food hall, the stalls, and here is that interstitial space. And this is where I, I really want to make the point. The interstitial space um, for us, you know, it's, it's open during the daytime once again. It becomes that space of exchange where anyone can come and, and have a collective experience. But not only that, there are spaces for you to tuck and still have a moment of privacy. Um, and then this becomes another idea of the urban room where all can share it, all can meet, and, and um, all can understand sort of the events and uh, that, that's going around them. Um, really quickly uh, about, about the, the face of the building, which were essentially a series of um, individual hotel rooms, which almost read as private quarters that were um, uh, a series of it was a conglomeration, as it were, to make the facade of the building, and it also sort of leaned away. So the scale of it felt quite articulated and away from the street to not completely take over um, as a as a mass. Eventually, th this is the courtyard space, the read from <clears throat> the food hall and the hotel uh, towards the left of your screen, and, and a space for once again, exchange and the idea of the urban room that we are constantly uh, attempting to articulate in our projects. I'll take you briefly um, to a project that we just completed, uh, or we just constructed and finished about two or three months ago. Well, we're in, we're in Orlando. Um, this is Corin Drive and Audubon Park, just um, in the Winter Park uh, area. And Corin Drive, we were asked by our client, which was a coffee shop, the, the Salty um, uh, Donut, which is uh, quite popular in Miami, and they wanted to introduce a, a space um, in, in Orlando. And the site, you see the existing building here to the left, and you, 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 you see sort of across the street, which spatially has similarities to the slide that I, that I showed you in Irvington, but of course, um, the tenant, the tenants here are, are 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 stronger and much more engaging. However, uh, what we wanted to articulate and was one of the things the city wanted to do was to make Core and Drive um, in its right away um, a lot more inviting and 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 slow down the speeds of cars sort of moving in and out. So, in order to think about this building and and we like to say that existing buildings, we're, we're, we're doing our best to, to redeem them, even in an adaptive reuse uh, point of view. Uh, we, we looked at what used to be an old auto service um, and also was a gas station at one point. That building certainly did its work, um, but, but it needed a new life. And one of the first things that we spoke to the client about um, seeing just one other idea further east um, of the East End Market is to actually uh, make a room on the outside that negotiates this um, rougher edge of automobiles that are that are going east and west, and to sort of break the barrier so folks can feel invited into this project and not simply be a suburban setback building. Um, this is one of the earlier photos um, when the when the project was 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 completed, and of course the edge um, is now articulated with with landscape. A large bench becomes a proper room. Um, there, this this brand is popular on their own. Uh, I'm sure they would have been fine maybe without our great design. However, this begins to draw people in who don't even need a coffee or or don't even want a donut. This um, during the time of pandemic has been a place for folks to just sit via the laptop and have a place of exchange because they don't have that much along the corridor of Corin.
And of course, <clears throat> um, as you go inside the building, we do um, spend a lot of time articulating the intimacy that you that you can see in the way we were talking about the loft earlier. But there are spaces for you to sort of get away and then have a, a private conversation to help again uh, speak about intimacy and lingering and staying at a place uh, longer, which in a sense would provide ownership and saying this is this is my uh, coffee shop this is where we have discussions and this is where i bring my friends family client i want to take the next few uh, slides just to mention one of the core things for us in terms of designing um, restaurants and hospitalities we we do we do a lot we're very fortunate um, to have designed um, buildings in Miami here, um, as you can see, and, and uh, Booyah Miami that was opened about six months ago. Um, we, we are fortunate to also have worked internationally and um, worked in Potsdam, um, Germany, and also in, in, in Berlin. Uh, so our, 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 the practice is, is fully excited about learning new cultures, learning about how one dwells, and, and staying flexible in, in the kind of research of how we articulate place in different countries. Um, and we're, we're quite proud that we're, we're working on this project right now. It's in, it's in Austin. And you know, we, we, we do have our, 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 our fun in working with intimacy, a quick uh, sketch of, of the windows we designed there. Um, and of course, this concept was was the living room. This is actually another project that we're doing for the, the Salty brand in and, and Austin. But I want to stop here for a moment and talk about a restaurant that, we're, that we completed um, in, in Wynwood. And this was for uh, Chef Morimoto. Uh, a very, very interesting um, design process for us. Uh, it, a quick anecdote. We, we gave our first brief and how we would negotiate um, this large space. It was a 4,000 square foot shell. And we, we spoke um, to Chef and mentioned, you know, we, we actually want to make these different voids and, and, and almost celebrate different parts of the city, um, overlapping some concepts that we um, are intrigued by in Japan, sort of down the corridors and seeing the golden guys in Japan and weaving that with the spontaneity and the um, art, art culture of Wynwood. Um, and uh, and we, we were quite proud of this. We, we spent a, a long time and, and, and Chef um, gave us a call and I think he was in Hawaii and said, we need to meet immediately, uh, which made us quite nervous. Um, what's interesting about the story, and I, and I say this for the, for the, for the students, um, the meeting that we had when we met immediately he had us come to his face, and he and his assistant taped out our concept drawing um, at full scale and proceeded to walk and ask us about every design decision. I have to admit, it was the first and only time it happened in my career so far. Uh, but this was a very rewarding um, uh, part for us. It was quite nerve-wracking in the moment. I won't. I won't lie. One of the things that we send to our office, we are intrigued about the detailing, about the lighting, about the the, uh, the sort of furniture and the signage that we design. But really, um, what we're what we're doing and what we're most proud of is curating and cultivating spaces uh, for folks to have conversations, um, whether it be between friends or whether it be between um, a mother and daughter, father and son, neighbor to neighbor, uh, we find that even though it's very, it's a very small thing to do, it allows us to play a role in community building and designing it at a high quality, no matter where we are, um, Wynwood or East Tampa, um, we, we provide a space that's quite charged. And I mentioned East Tampa, um, because I want to transition to talk about collective agency. Um, and, you know, for us, this is an example where um, we really partnered with a client um, to come with a, a, a unique solution that we're, that we're quite proud of. 
this is a, a very modest building. Um, it's only the first phase of a really large um, East Tampa development that we're that we're doing and working on. But we call this project the Haven, and the Haven is a halfway house that um, a, a, a church uh, north of the site is transitioning folks that are in jail uh, to come and have a place to stay um, before they get themselves back into the community. And one of the moments where um, certainly it helped with our social capital that we have with the client is at one point the client had a, had a, a thought of efficiency and wanting to help more and saying, can we maximize this by putting at least 14 rooms here? And myself and the design team stressed, you know, it'd be worth just losing two rooms so we can have a common space for folks to have exchange. We don't want this to be a building where you transition just to store as many people as possible. It was a it was a negotiation and exchange that um, both from the client end came from the idea of getting more people to transition, but from our end as designers and space planners and understanding how uh, people exchange in the way you design space, we we had we came to a conclusion collectively where it was worth losing two rooms in order to have a common space that would provide a sort of richness um, to the folks who are who are adapting um, and 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 transitioning back into the community and not feel stored. So in a lot of ways, um, we mean it sincerely. Um, we we are we are we are practicing um, no matter wh where we are, um, and we of course are practicing to meet the meet to the client's budget, but our design quality does not change. Um, it is at the highest level because as we, as I mentioned, uh, design is certainly a tool for all. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to take us uh, a little bit further south and this is in, in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, this is a project that we are just starting uh, and then fish trunk. Uh, this, of course, is the waterfront. Um, some of you may know Ex Las Solas, um, which is, uh, has a good density and a lot of activity here. And Sistrunk is highlighted here um, in this boundary. And uh, uh, unfortunately, like many uh, American cities uh, where it was either just cheaper to run a highway through or the collective voice here, which is mostly African American community, um, um, didn't have the agency and the power to fight against running I-95 and US-1 and sort of landlocking uh, them. The CRA today, to their credit, is looking and putting uh, money to um, get a sense of getting this fabric back together uh, in a way that, that is sustainable. And we were asked to just look at one building so far, but just to show you a bit of the um, effort that the, the CRA has placed in making these maps, um, categorizing the amount of green space uh, here. And, you know, this is a this is a critical moment for us in our collective history. You know, big questions are being asked. How do we empower people? How do we develop our neighborhoods? How do we celebrate the rich history? Um, uh, how do we acknowledge generational trauma but move on? Um, and how do we develop our neighborhoods? How do we celebrate? Um, how do we celebrate individuality? How do we celebrate um, small businesses that were there and thriving at one point and are now uh, possibly being displaced because uh, this is in very close proximate proximity to Ex Las Solas and could um, develop even further? We were very proud um, to, <laughs> uh, I have to say, to be reached out to um, very cold. Uh, we did not know this client at all. The client found us on, on social media, um, and then I, I, I met with him several times and, and really um, enjoyed uh, his position and, of development. So the, the project is negotiating um, micro retail from 200 square feet to 800 square feet, uh, looking at um, <clears throat> businesses that are already there from, from uh, salons to banks, um, uh, and, and trying to find a, a retail scenario where there can be exchange. Um, what I should say is all of this barren land is already yeah, earmarked for almost um, 800 
units of, of residential. Uh, and we are looking at this uh, space that we're designing as a, a sort of a community no node where smaller business who can um, afford um, a smaller space to, to rent can be in the heart of this development and can be a place of exchange and, and not suffer from, from displacement. And, and very early on, we're looking at not only meeting the, the quick requirements of micro retail from 200 to 800 square feet, but um, looking at shaded pathways, you know, lush public gardens, providing inclusive spaces where everyone should have the opportunity to feel that they're part uh, of this project. Um, once again, it, it's key to us to provide that neighborhood uh, living room and, and the agronom project, as we call it, um, uh, sort of building and toiling on the ground together in the best sense of the word. Um, it's the kind of driving vision of this project, you know, seeking inclusivity, partnership, um, and, a, and a place for the community to call home. The CRA is uh, reviewing this project um, as we speak, and we're, proud, we're quite proud of it. Um, and, and once again, to mention, we, we, we are looking at this as a kit of parts um, where there's a, there's a structure that can be deployed uh, depending on the module 200 to 800 square feet that can be deployed in different ways in different parts of the uh, city, as it were, um, to uh, uh, encourage the micro retail, the sort of smaller um, uh, uh, barbecue restaurants so they can sort of live here and, and be engaged. Uh, and just a shot of, of our, our first thoughts of what that community um, exchange place could be in, in the garden, and very faintly you might not be able to make it out, um, are, are, are names of, of all folks who are providing uh, the funds to, to make this project happen. I will um, talk about this project uh, last and leave some room for us to have a conversation here. About 18 months ago, uh, through the developer, we were asked to look at 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Um, most of you will know that the, during the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s, the 16th Street Baptist Church served as um, the organizational headquarters in a site of mass meetings and a rallying point for African Americans um, to protest uh, systematic racism. Uh, and, and, and of course, um, was also the, the place of serious um, trauma where um, we, we lost um, four girls to the, to the bombing um, in 1963. And right now we, we were negotiating and thinking about how does one move from trauma in memorial to protest um, and start to think about um, getting back our collective agency through uh, um, doing what we do is which is celebrate and, and develop. The church itself gets um, about 2,000 visitors per week. Of course, this was pre-COVID. Uh, and the visitors simply come here because the building is charged and has a memorial um, and then simply leave after that. Uh, these areas that are orange are, 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 are pretty much um, flat, not developed. Uh, and one of, the, one of our first tasks is to look at, if you see the church here, is to look at developing a very large program um, from student housing to 90,000 square, 90, square feet of student housing, 64,000 square feet of office, uh, two hotels at 70,000 square feet each, multifamily, a, a youth center, retail, um, and we've, we've convinced and we've done the gymnastics enough so far that we have quite a large amount of green space and you can see um, the courtyard ideas are, are starting to make their way into our early sketches. I certainly don't have the time to talk about the particulars of all of it and it's really early on. I, I hope Bob um, would would invite me to come back once, once, once we have this uh, moving forward again uh, in the in the fall, but I, I do mention it because this is 
the ideal work for Storen. Uh, we want to do um, work that empowers our community, that acknowledges trauma, but moves forward and has proper development. We want to be um, agents to the community. And certainly, um, I have a group of folks who are not enticed um, by individual success, but are working to serve our community with the design talent that we have. And I'll, I'll end with that. Thank you uh, so much, Everald. Um, there, there's a lot to unpack here, <laughs> um, which is good. Um, let me just open the floor for, for questions. I would invite those of you listening to um, either enter a question in the chat or just turn on your mic and, uh, and ask us a question directly. So go ahead if you have some questions for Everald. Hello, Mr. Colas. How are you doing? This is Brandon Newton. Hi, hi, Brandon. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was very um, enlightening. Um, you touched on a lot of important points that um, I care about myself. Um, one particular question I have is um, when you're designing residences, um, commercial buildings, and even urban spaces, um, do you keep in mind um, the vernacular architecture um, that is already present in that area you're designing? Um, and that you're engaging with? Because I'm asking, because um, you did a project on um, West Tampa, I believe, or East Tampa, mm -hmm. and um, there's a lot of new development in Seminole Heights, um, Tampa Heights, and a lot of the new buildings aesthetic tends to clash with the pre-existing pre, um, aesthetic. And uh, to my understanding, a lot of um, residences um, kind of lament contemporary um, modern architecture style um, because the new designs don't acknowledge um, of what's pre-existing already there. So do you keep that in mind when you're designing um, to not have that friction within the community? Sure, um, I'm glad. Thanks for the question, Brandon. This, this actually brings a, a good moment to talk about an, an anecdote. Um, I didn't show, we, we designed um, a set of triplex, uh, so three townhomes side by side. And we had a very similar conversation where we we were negotiating some of the placements of the buildings in order to get clear stories, light, make sure the building was brief, right? Um, enhancing part of the vernacular, which was a lot of gable roofs, but we were doing subtle changes in gable roof to make it perform better. Um, and we had a meeting, and it was a the enlightening in a lot of ways. Um, I'm, I'm part of our community. We were talking about design. This vernacular, which is a language, or okay, about a language, and the building perform and what it means. Uh, conversation came to a point where, uh, to see Brandon, we, we got this project is designed too well for the community, um, which hurt because it it was in my face that for some somehow the social narrative um, has been uh, only certain people get good design and only certain people get another way of rationalizing how you position a building, the kind of materials you place. Um, we're, 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 not, we're not simply putting vinyl ship lap, we're putting materials that can, that can last a long time. We're putting masonry sometimes, we're putting wood. So therefore there's a different language that comes out of it and it comes out of performance. Um, that's one thing. And we, we have been able to uh, sort of win that conversation as we move more and we become more part of East Tampa. Um, we are doing a larger development and saying that this is not simply how it looks like, this is how it should perform um, and how it's going to last. So that's, that's one. And another question about vernacular, which goes beyond just uh, East Tampa um, is, I want to I want to speak very clearly that um, for for a long time vernacular has meant this building type is is what it should do and it's and it's appropriate here and I think that 
that taking that in immediately um, allows for not enough research and not enough curiosity to say this is how it can be. Um, so in that sense, for sure, um, I'm, I'm interested in context. I'm interested in the height of buildings. I'm in, interested in not casting shadows on my neighbor. I'm interested in the, the, the way the project is laid out, that people can come in and out. I'm interested in security um, during, during uh, night hours, certainly. Um, but to simply say, I'm going to do a gable roof because there's a gable roof there. No, our community deserves more research than that. I really appreciate your question. Thanks for allowing me to bring that up. Thank you for it. Thank you for your answer. Thanks, Brandon. That was a very good question. Um, Tim Johnson says, very nice project, Liz. Salty is a great little spot on Corrine. So you have two thumbs up. <laughs> also, well, Tim, Tim's in Orlando. That's right. Be <laughs> careful over there and go to Donut. <laughs> I can't wait to visit. Uh, Justin Stone asks, what was one of your um, main challenges? Uh, what was one of the main challenges you faced with doing residential housing? And that I'm not sure which project that would be, but maybe it's the East Tampa project. Um, sure. Um, well, let me let me add to that. So one of the, one of the main challenges there is, of course, um, there, there there's always this conversation uh, where folks are putting in their funds to develop and uh, and and a and a place where they're taking a lot of risk. Let's say, let's say the East Tampa project, and they they want to be very conscious of the materials and the amount of space that you articulate in order for them to get enough rooms and 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 the haven. I think one of the challenges that we always, you know, I, I think I'm going to say the same thing again is we we are engaging in a sort of discussion where um, my clients and communities that have been marginalized. Um, I, you almost have to have this conversation of saying that y y your space deserves dignity. It deserves a high quality of architecture, um, and 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 it can be a catalyst that actually changes how things happen, versus feeling um, an almost hat to chest saying that um, this this may be a little too much for us now. I think that's that's one of the things, and the reason it's a challenge. And I, I don't I didn't remember the person's name who asked that question is. Because it hurts deeply, right? Um, I, I I grew up in in that scenario, um, and 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 I after practice and and study, I fully understand the fact that um, we want things that that we can call our own. We want things of the highest quality. Um, we're not simply trying to just maneuver um, anymore. And if I could talk about the black experience, you know, it's it's always been transitioning as it were um uh it was an interesting lecture i was listening to the other day where someone says if you ask a black person where they live they usually say this is where i stay because it's temporary and i'm moving um we we are interested in talking about belonging in a place to have ownership and that's where we're trying to uh, uh persuade uh, these projects as best as we can knowing we have limitations um because policy has to uh, has to buttress that or else we, 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 we could be cut out the legs. Well, you know, that's such an interesting comment to bring up. Um, I mean, you know, belonging, right? When you say ownership, it, it, it means financial ownership, but it means ownership far beyond dollars and cents, right? Precisely, precisely. Street to own the square, to own the community and for it to be part of you and you to be part of it. And um, um, I, I go back to the, well, frankly, I can't not go back to earlier this week when the verdict came out on George Floyd and people kind of gripping their cell phones as a community in the public square and um, the absolutely joyous response, I mean, and, and, and sad response. And it was one verdict out of many, many. And we know it's uh, far, far from over, I'm afraid. Right. Um, but it, but it was um, um, who was it last night? Was it Dr. Dyson or <laughs> I, f I forget who it was? But he was talked. It, was it Michael Eric Dyson? I, I didn't I didn't hear him last night. But yeah, I think it was yeah 
Michael Eric Dyson. He talked about, I think it was him. I was listening to a couple of different people and he talked about hope. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's Dr. Dyson. He talks beautifully. But he talked about hope as, as a really, you know, powerful thing that you needed to have hope. And he juxtaposed it against other emotions. But hope was sort of held out as um, something that was necessary to kind of function. Yeah, I want to add to that. I, you know, I'm I'm old enough to remember Rodney King as a teen, and I'm I'm, I'm, I certainly remember Trayvon Martin as if it was yesterday. Um, And on the Chauvin trial uh, and the verdict, it 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 was a moment where, uh, at least for me, I could take a breath and say that this straight line um, now finally has a curve. Finally, something's changing. Um, so I didn't hear Michael Eric Dyson, but I, I, I do have a sense of hope because it seems as if this past year, um, you know, I was I was in I was in Gainesville when the very first protest happened after George Floyd's passing and murder, and the image from Depot Park was a majority of people who did not look like me. Um, they looked like you, Bob, and and I and I and I felt. I felt if white allies um, are feeling this trauma, and I'm not talking about empathy, I'm are really feeling this trauma as uh, as for them, and understanding that our great country was built on the free labor of blacks. If they, if 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 that is a moment for them to speak up on our behalf, then there's hope. Um, I hate to be so bleak, but all collective black voices could. Could, could could protest, but until we have white allies, not much is going to change in the United States. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, um, and and I think a perfect example is um, another person I heard speaking who's a professor at, uh, I think it's Morgan State, interviewed his students, you know, black students, uh, black class, and he, 25 students, he polled them. How many of you think there's going to be a verdict of guilty in this trial. It was maybe four or five. I I mean, there was such, it's not even fair to call it cynicism. It's not even cynical. It's it's, that there's a kind of baked in expectation of these kind of parades and these Mm -hmm. kind of shows. Um, And and I happened to listen to a lot of the the trial um, on both ends and um, um, you know, I I couldn't see how it could go anywhere other than guilty, but <laughs> but we know that it was almost highly likely that it could have gone the other way. Sure, sure. Um, l- let me kind of move around a little bit and sure. first of all, I- invite other questions and comments. Um, if you have them, please speak up. But um, I, I want to talk about something as simple as the coffee shop. Mm. I- I- project and I know that street well I used to live down there and um, um, you know the, the the kind of road that that is is almost impossible right I mean how do you design along that right. and I think the strategy to kind of make a, a place within the place mm-hmm. place there's this kind of nesting of place from the the sprawly street down to corner where two people can sit in is really fascinating and you know, we've realized how much we've missed that, right? Mm, and I, and I wrote down the importance of meeting. And maybe you said that, or maybe I thought it, but, mm. um, you, you know, like, like we personally in our house have had it pretty easy. I mean, we're mm. a unit of four people and a, and a cat and a couple of birds. And, <laughs> go business and I go into the school every once in a while and it's a ghost town. And, um, but, but not everyone has. And, um, you know, we know that there have been and will continue to be mental health issues come out of this. And I think just to be in a space with other people is so powerful. Yeah. And, and I really, I mean, the, the restaurant in Linwood was also felt very much the same thing where there were nested places. And I think the way you handle things at the urban scale also has to do with nested places. The uh, uh, Burn project is very much that way from what I could read, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, is, is that a kind of I mean, clearly, it's a common theme that begins to bind the way you think about making place and making spaces. 
It is, it is. And I, and I think it has to do, um, that strategy actually came with some of the conversation in, in living in St. Pete, meaning, you know, St. Pete, uh, we were talking offline, um, has a has a popularity now where folks are developing and, 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 and folks are getting used to density and how to negotiate density. So for us, we're saying in our projects, there's, there's layers, right? If you want to be center stage, there's a, there's a pocket for that. And, but if you want to tuck away and have a, have a conversation, but not completely out of the scenario, then there's another node for that. And, and we've just found that not only as a way of approaching folks and how they talk about urban edges and come to it, but um, it ends up being a place where you can go to uh, the Salty maybe three times and have three different experiences, depending on where you sit. You can go to uh, Morimoto's and depending if you want to be seen or not want to be seen or, or if you're being served table side or just having a blast outside, you have these different moments in one urban area. And then hopefully, hopefully our, our, if, we, if we do these well as designers, uh, folks in the community would say, that corner is where I have my client meeting. That corner is where I meet with my, my, my grandma who I love and loves to dine and we sit outside. We, we, we end up making these um, refuge space, refuge within, um, within an urban space, which, I, which we find um, fascinating and we do a lot of drawing to sort of articulate it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, get, I just get the feeling that I see this kind of, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a weaving project, mm -hmm. whether outside or within small space, big space and they feel very woven when I look at them I really mm -hmm. I really like that um, in the work um, um, I'm interested in this micro retail um, yeah. you know, communities have tried this at various times um, do you think this particular project has a good shot of being approved and moving forward I do I, I do um, however I, I am optimistic so the, the CRA down there has been trying several models. They have X amount of dollars to use here. And one model eventually was to leave the storefronts as they were along six, six trunk, which is the corridor that runs east and west, and to give X amount of money, uh, hire an architect and a, <clears throat> and a contractor to sort of reface the street edge and give it a, a, a new look. Um, and that was one model of how they're thinking about getting the corridor lively again. The, the, the second model, which is the model you're seeing here, has to do with the fact that it's already earmarked that there's going to be a lot of resi development around around uh, this the, the site, as I mentioned in the presentation. But can they have uh, a smaller micro um, retail unit that the the rent could be subsidized and folks can start their small business, be there because it's not as um, Strenuous and price per square footage, price per square footage, and a big, large tower where you have to sort of balance that performa. But because it's low um, and it's a smaller retail uh, size, it, it, you could start there. And if it works well, you can continue. You can go from 200 to 800, um, and then eventually, if you're doing very well, you can move out and maybe pay the, the the higher rent. But it's not a standalone. And unfortunately, I couldn't show the other images because they're we're not designing them. But it's being buttressed. Um, with other activity. So you'll have foot traffic from those almost 700 uh, <clears throat> rooms to use the, 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 the spaces where it's a barbershop, getting uh, a nice sandwich in the morning, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the master plan, Bob, makes sense. The CRA is quite thoughtful. Um, we can only hope that, that this is successful and, uh, and the meetings have been, have been uh, quite close and, and with, with ideas. It's CRA funded? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Part of it's part of sorry, I should say part of it's CRA CRA funded, and the other part is going to be a, a private developer. So it's a it's a public private partnership. Well, such a great use, and what I like is the fact that someone can graduate from six hundred or from two hundred to six hundred square feet, but not change their address. They're Precisely. Extensively in the complex. The Precisely. other thing that stands out is the public space that's embedded in the in the in, yeah. in it. Because you don't, you, I mean, you never see that. I mean, right. you usually see that. And I, right. I think it binds it to the community in a completely different way. 
Correct. Um, one of the things I didn't mention um, in that is there's the, the sort of black building is, is an, the black color building is an existing building. It's a local gazette that's there. Um, and, and he he as an owner has um, wanted whatever development that's going to happen there. He's going to stay. He's going to be part of it. Um, and he has a, a, a great pull in the community and has a great voice. Um, he writes about Six Truck um, uh, weekly. Um, he was 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 the biggest champion of having that that private courtyard that um, could also hold names of people who in, invest um, in this project and, and really have a sense of ownership. So uh, he's sort of holding the, the, the trumpet with the uh, private developer to make this happen and hopefully be sustainable. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, I'll pause with my questions because I have a bunch of them and okay. ask anyone else has any questions or comments. Uh, please feel free to turn on your mic or put something in the chat. And you have some very nice comments in the chat. You have a bunch of fans out there, Everald. <laughs> oh, man. Now I, I owe a lot of money now. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing, I want to return to the project you did with BIG. Sure. Uh, the so-called issue of affordable housing versus market rate housing. Which, you know, you tend to at first blush think of that as a New York problem or a Boston problem. But but in reality, we know it's a problem everywhere. It's even a problem in Tampa. And, you know, mm -hmm. Tampa seemed like such a cheap place 10 or 12 years ago when we moved. Right. And right. we look at real estate prices a lot, but I understand it's it's no longer cheap. And I see yeah. maybe what things are selling for in St. Pete, and it's kind of remarkable, actually, right? Indeed, indeed. So um, what, what students might not realize is that developers um, make arrangements with, with the municipality in order to build a building. They, they have to make a certain percentage of um, so-called affordable units. Right. And affordable in New York is a nurse. <laughs> it's a fireman, right. it's a police officer. Right. I mean, right. it's, not like, it's not like you're destitute. Sure. Um, it's an educator. It's an elementary school right. teacher. So, um, and and very often you pointed it out. You know, I remember I, I've heard of developments where the people in the affordable units have a different entry. I mean, they kind of enter in the back door. I mean, sure. how offensive is that? Right. So I think that um, um, I think that's a fascinating project. I didn't know its entire history. I've looked at it. You know, it's been widely published. Sure. Um, and I think the ethic that came out of that office is really good to hear because we see big and we see the projects and Kirk is a charming guy. He could sell anything to anyone. <laughs> but okay. it's so good to hear that this very healthy ethic about the duty we have. You know, the, the, the as you say, the power we have is minimal mm. and needs to be strategically wielded. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed, and I, I would only add, um, and this is from a just personal experience. Um, I I would say that maybe that I might have been fortunate because the first three firms that I worked with were 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 all um, European, and may have not um, grasped what was going on with the developers when we were working in, a, in an American city, and 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 th th through that um, we would make proposals that are just straight up you know we this this, this building design the way it is and the, the square footage works the way it works because that's the way we do things um but when, when that question came up um it was an enlightening moment um to hear that response from one of the one of the leaders um that said we you know we designed to empower people which which was which was fascinating um i'm not i don't know but what, what, if maybe if i was working with a with a uh, truly American, you know, who understood the fabric of how New York worked and had these issues come up. Um, maybe I would have unfortunately got some bad habits of making things smaller or doing things, Bob, that are actually <clears throat> turning the knob very, very, a very, very small portion, meaning doing less finishes in order to make the performer of a building work. I mean, wh what does that really mean if you just have a, a, a corner in your building where no one cares because the finishes are less. Uh, this wasn't this wasn't as nice as the other side of the building. What does that really mean? I mean, it's not gonna it's not gonna last. You're gonna you're gonna circle people in and out. The the, the shared corridor is gonna be uh, trashed because no one has ownership of it. So uh, 
I, I guess I'm thankful that I, there might have been a bit of a naivete <laughs> um, working in, in, the, in, in those in those three, but I, I would have to give um, uh, the the BIG uh, credit for for having that sort of ethic and and responding that way. Yeah, I think ethic is important. Maybe there was some naivete, but I think the intersection of naivete and an ethical position can take you pretty far. It would seem, you know, 100 percent. Yeah, 100 percent. Um, Jasmine points out that an affordable <laughs> affordable flat in Brooklyn is twenty two hundred dollars for a tiny <laughs> two bedroom. <laughs> Comes uh, hey, hey, Jasmine, how are you? It, it was interesting. We we at on the East One Twenty Six corridor uh, before it was filled with the new hospital, the the um, the AMI, the average um, income there was actually quite low. So the affordable line was a bit more realistic than it would have been if you were, let's say, in Midtown or, or, or in the East Village or that kind of thing. So it, 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 you know, Spanish Harlem hadn't been as developed as West Harlem. So that that those affordable, those 20 or so units were um, had a wider demographic of who could actually rent them. Um, yeah. 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 Hey, Jasmine. Thanks for that nugget. You remind me of why I no longer live in New York. I'm just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> um, please, folks. We'll invite uh, any other questions or comments. Um, I have a comment. Um, so, having just visited the Salty Donut actually like last month. I didn't actually go for the donuts or the coffee itself. I went for the, the experience of the space, actually. I like saw it on Google Maps and I was like, well, I need to go here. Um, and I definitely, like, like what you're saying, like felt multiple experiences within the space itself. Like no matter where you sit, you get a different vibe. And I really enjoyed that a lot, um, especially that um, interior wall that separates that sort of like uh, meeting space from like the rest of the building. I really, really enjoyed that a lot. So, and it was so interesting seeing like the before, like what the space was before versus like what, how it is now. Like I really enjoyed that a lot. Thank you. I, I can't see who's speaking, but whoever Sorry. that was. It, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, no, look, uh, certainly, um, I, and I know some of my guys might be on the call. It probably gives us um, serious joy because these are these are these are subtleties um, in design, but th they're not easy <laughs> uh, to do. Um, and 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 I'm, I'm glad you, you you felt it, and I'm glad it's working. At, that 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 means a lot. Thank you for saying that. You know, I think the takeaway is that it's a coffee shop. <laughs> it's, it, it can do all these things, and, and I think yeah. that's so important for students to think about because there's such opportunities in any design project. I mean, the the small library is just a lovely space and a space of intimacy, and so powerful for those for those clients, right? Right. And to share a little project like that, I mean, 400 square feet is 400 square feet. That's right. 400 square feet to do something with. Right. Now, Adam points out that his one bedroom in Brooklyn is uh, 2,900. Adam likes to live large. We all know that. <laughs> so, of course it is. Oh, Adam. good to see yeah. you, Adam. Thank you for being here. Adam, come on over to St. Pete. We'll take you. <laughs> well, I saw him on your on your. Yeah, Adam, 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 um, Adam, uh, as well as Christelle Bataku and Brandon Cook uh, manage our business development and marketing, and they do a, a quite a good job of uh, speaking about our smallest projects in, in the right way. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's great. Well, it's a great team you've put together in a relatively short period of time, and. Uh, uh, you've drawn from some great resources that we both know, such as such as Adam's practice. And <laughs> yeah. Let me see. This is great. Um, Jasmine says, I think your projects, even from the time when you were a student, have always felt inevitable. I mean that as a huge compliment. Once you design something, it's hard to imagine the world without it afterwards. No. Oh. Thanks, Dad. I really yeah. appreciate that. And and there's a lot of recruiting going on to come to Florida right now with various people. <laughs> yes, it's a beautiful come on over. <laughs> we Florida welcomes with open arms for good or bad. <laughs> you know, it's it's changed so much. Um, yeah. 
Florida has. It, I mean, you know, I think when I started at my education in Gainesville, it was 33,000 mm. students, 30, which seemed big, but it's almost doubled, right? Indeed. And yeah. if you've been to Gainesville recently, the construction that's gone on is pretty bizarre. I mean, it looks like generic land. Mm. And had a chance mm. to construct these corridors and make them habitable. I, I think of the image of the green benches you showed in St. Pete. And that could have been University Avenue. I mean, that could have been 13th Street. Oh, and mm -hmm. it's, it, there's no place to walk, yet there's hundreds of people pouring onto the street, thousands. Right. And it's it's such an incredible missed opportunity. And, yeah. and it's done. I mean, this will never be redone. Uh, yeah. any, and I, it's a shame. It would have taken just a little zoning change, and it could have been a great quarter. Um, agreed. So agreed. This happens. Agreed. I have I have been there, and I and I have seen that articulation, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, we, we were pretty shocked when we were there recently. We hadn't been in that part of town for quite a while, and uh, um, but they got Depot Park, I think, pretty right for, after all these years. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Charmed by that. So a great space it's a great space and uh when we go there my, my daughter spends a good time in that park and and i remember when i was in school um that that area was was um was different to say the least yeah yeah well look folks any other comments we'll 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 let uh ever get back to work or maybe get home <laughs> <laughs> no i'm yeah i'm gonna prepare to go on a flight tomorrow to austin to open the uh or not open to to look at construction on the uh, other salt either. Great, great. Yeah. Well, um, Emerald, I can't thank you enough for doing this. You know I've wanted to have you um, on board here for a long time. I know you've been busy as can be. Thanks for taking time. And sure. we'll get you more involved with the school moving forward. It'll be my pleasure and um, looking forward to you coming a little bit closer to the Bay. Uh, I don't know if that's public yet, but uh, <laughs> next, next semester, yeah. I, I, I promise I'll be there. And okay. thank you for taking on some tough issues that are affecting us all day by day. And yeah. we need to have more of these conversations about right. how black and brown bodies are treated in America today and how we have to design for everyone in an empowering and inclusive way. So thank you so much for continuing to open our eyes. You're, you're welcome, Bob. And, and thanks for the invite. And we'll, we'll talk soon. OK, you take care, my friend. Take care. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces. Really made my day. Take care. Miss you, Bob. <laughs>